Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Polyhedron Collider cast episode 2. Hey, uh, we're back. The, <laughs> the meeple strike back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Attack <laughs> of the clowns I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as you can hear there's three of us again, so it's me Stephen Tudor from Polyhedron Collider, I've also have with me... Andy Lewis, Sonic H again. And John the Mighty Cage. <laughs> John Mighty Cage, Johnny Cage wins. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a couple of things I wanted to mention before we get into the podcast proper. First of all, I did have a bit of dilemma when I was editing the last episode on whether to keep our uh, naughty words in or not. We um, we're ten- <laughs> I don't <laughs> yeah. know what to We mean. dropped a couple of F-bombs, so I've decided I'm going to keep them in as long as they're not too crude or offensive, but with insensible levels. So, Andy, you've been warned. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. We are on iTunes as explicit. And there will be the odd f bomb. If that does get likely to offend, then well, tough, tough. Because once Andy starts going, it's going to get even worse. <laughs> that was quite reserved. <laughs> no, you did, you did, you did well. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention is the UK Games Expo. Now, this is a big gaming convention. In fact, it's the UK's biggest gaming, gaming convention. It's been held at the NEC on the 3rd and 5th of June. That's just up the road. It is, it's just it's less than an hour. <gasps> I think we should Saturday probably morning. go. Well, yeah, I will definitely be going. Mm. I suggest you two go as well. Now, I did wonder whether John will be able to go or whether it will be his first anniversary. Uh, well, let, let's... One of those is marginally more important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll see you guys there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, it is um, a big gaming convention that covers every kind of tabletop gaming so there's loads of board games there there's loads of role-playing games miniatures games collectible card games there's vendor halls where you can buy almost any game as long as it's in print yes andy <laughs> drive there so you can fit them all in the boot of your car well, given that i drive an i go that's two games true <laughs> you could, we could go in the master and then uh, well oh, that would be dangerous wouldn't it it would be dangerous. we could fold the back seats down and fill it <laughs> There's also uh, loads of tournaments, there's uh, open gaming as well. Um, basically, anywhere there is an open space, somebody will have pulled out a board game and start playing it anyway. Is, is there enough time for a single game of Twilight Imperium? Or is it not that long? Um, it's three days, and people... So, so one game. So if you get going quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you get yourself in gear, hopefully you should. If you start you know, first thing Friday morning, you should mm. be done by Sunday lunchtime. Um, the other thing I want to know, if you are a listener and you are a, a publisher or a designer or an artist or something else involved in game creation, I'm going to be working with UK gaming media network groups like I did in the last two years. So we did several video interviews, videos of the shop floor and the events that are going on. So if you are one of those people, get in touch because we are looking for people to interview and I'll also be going around with the microphone as well in case we need to interview people as well. Or if you've got a game to show off. In fact, if you've got a new game that's coming out, let me know because I want to feature it on the site. I did a feature last year. It got picked up by Reddit. It did really well. Yeah, some really good stuff on there actually as well. A really yeah. interesting mm. mix of, th of things. Yeah, and it is. because it, I don't know whether this is the same across the world, but we do seem to have a really wide spectrum of games at the Expo. Like, I think last year on the list, we had Alien vs. Predator, which is this, you know, intense awesome. miniatures game, and then a little family game, which was suitable for, like, everyone from five years old and up, kind of thing. Mm. Not, so not Alien vs. Predator. Not Alien no, vs. Right, Predator, okay, no, okay. no. <laughs> That's try, a shame. Trying to explain a face hugger to a five-year-old is a bit... <laughs> it's just really friendly. It just wants to be friends. Oh. <laughs> um, so if you do want to get in touch with that, it's uh, details are on the web website, um, or you can go email me at polyhedroncollidergames at gmail.com, or contact on facebook.polyhedroncollider.com, or twitter at polyhedronc. <laughs> because I had to pick a name which was too long for Twitter to fit in. Oh. Right, well, let's talk about some games then, shall we? Oh, I suppose. That yeah. sounds like a plan. So, uh, you want to start? Andy, what have you been playing? Me? Well. Yeah. Um, what haven't you been playing? What haven't I been playing? Well, look at this list. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I did, um, I did, uh, I did chop it down a bit because there would have been a bit of a retread. Um, what have I been playing? Well, it kind of falls into two categories, really. Um, I've, I've gone through a couple of games I've bought over the last month and gone through on my own a few times, but not actually gone through with other people, which I suspect may change the experience somewhat, um, and games I have played with other people. So um, I'm going to say probably actually Viticulture to start with, which I have played with other people, the good lady, and um, amongst others. 
And um, some non-good ladies. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't like to comment. <laughs> um, and Viticulture is a, a work placement game, so we talked about those last time, uh, but it is much, much simpler than, than something like uh, Euphoria, although it's made by the same people, um, Stonemaier, um, and it's actually surprisingly good fun. Uh, for something that is, that sound, I mean, basically the idea of Viticulture is you own a vineyard and you make wine. Which sounds like a good premise for a exactly, game. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Uh, but looking at, the, looking at the box art, it looks really quite, forgive the pun, dry. Um, <laughs> and um, not particularly exciting, but it's actually really quite good fun. There's a lot to it. Um, ultimately, you have a vineyard, and you are growing grapes, you own fields, and you are ultimately trying to fulfil wine orders um, in order to gain victory points. Uh, so the more wine orders you get, the more chance of winning? Uh, to a point. It gives you... right. There's... <laughs> There's essentially about three mechanics to the game. You need to fulfil wine orders, and the wine orders can vary, um, both in size and complexity. Um, they are based on ages of wine and types of wine. So you can grow red and white grapes in your in your vineyards of yeah. varying qualities. So they start ranging from qualities from one to four. And you have to buy the grapes at the start or something you, like that? Yeah, well, you, there are four decks of cards in the game. There's one for types of grapes or vines mm -hmm. that you then plant in your fields. And your fields have a maximum uh, value, so you've got various values of grape. Okay. There's no one from one to four. And you can plant any number of values of grapes in one field, but obviously you can't exceed the value of the field. So you have five, six, and a seven field. And things like Chardonnay are more valuable grapes than something like Pinot, for example. <laughs> okay. At least they are in this game. Right. I am not a wine connoisseur, so I don't really know any better. I'm not a wine connoisseur either, so... No. If I it was like beer or whiskey, accurate. then it would, be, it would be fine. I mean, from, from what little I know from having been a waiter many years ago, it seems reasonable. That's right. all I'm going to say. I'd say I'm a wine connoisseur. I mean, I can definitely tell a 10 from a 13, for example. <laughs> Percentage, right? That's how you get. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. More, more is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and um, once you've 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 grown your grapes, so the the game is the game is split into four seasons, the four seasons of the year. So that constitutes essentially a, a, a turn of the, a round of the board. Um, and um, in spring, uh, you decide basically when your workers get out of bed. <laughs> so it's like a, there's a, a little um, Do you table. employ bears? <laughs> <laughs> bears are known for their great breaking <laughs> ability. Absolutely, they're very good at crushing grapes. Yeah. Um, and you essentially, it's essentially determining turn order. So the whilst the, the first turn marker progresses around um, the, the group once per turn, uh, the first person then decides when they actually want to take their, their go. So there's a table, and the earlier you go, to the f essentially the fewer bonuses you get. So if you go later in the game, um, or later in the, in, the, in the round, you gain, say, for example, an extra worker temporarily for that year. Okay. Or you gain an extra visitor card or, an, uh, or some money or something like that. Mm. And they vary depending on when you want to go in the game. Uh, so it's a bit like Five Tribes when you're bidding for a turn, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then once everyone's done that, you go into summer. Sorry, yeah, summer, where you essentially you're doing your growing and your your preparation for the rest of the year, in which you can plant vines, you can build facilities in your vineyard like um, uh, a tasting room, or you can expand your cellar, or all that sort of stuff. Uh, because certain types of wine need certain sizes of cellar. So, for example, champagne. Like the highest end stuff needs a huge cellar to age. Okay, so it's not like more. extra, the extra bits and pieces like that don't just add sneaky victory points elsewhere. It's they, well, you may need them uh, because when you're fulfilling wine orders, some wine orders might say, well, I need a champagne. Mm -hmm. But that wine order will be worth a lot more victory points than say something like I just want a couple of years, you know some, some cheap bottles of, um, of Beaujolais Nouveau sling it on the back of the truck and away you go and that'll only be like two victory points for example. Gotcha. Um, so once you've done all of that, you can also take people on a tour around your vineyard. Um, and if you've got things like a tasting room, you get little bonuses for that. 
Um, you can also build things like yokes, which allow you to make uh, to basically harvest your grapes early, or you can uproot vines and sort of change the contents of your field. Okay. Um, but also, certain grapes require certain facilities, like um, trellises or irrigation. Mm -hmm. So you can't grow certain grapes think, without these bonuses. You'd think most of them would need irrigation, but... <laughs> uh, apparently not. Again, not a grape expert, so <laughs> you can grow any old rubbish as long as, long as, uh, as long, you, you've got these things. Um, but once you do that, and then you go into autumn, which is, again, kind of a, um, a fracky turn where you draw uh, what are called visitor cards, and you can have either summer card, summer visitors, or winter visitors. They're basically... Um, functional. So a visitor will give you um, either a, they'll give you a choice. Like you can spend, say, five gold instead of six gold to build a facility, or if you dump four bottles of wine, you can gain four victory points and some money, or something like that. So they give right. you an opportunity to do some sort of exchange. Yeah, 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 and you know you can and the the, the special action cards. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. basically. Yeah, and then. You go into winter, and that gives you a chance to harvest and press your grapes, turn them into wines, uh, and use winter visitors. So a thing more like things like um, traders or promoters and things like that. And then that's the end of the year. And at the end of the year, if you've made any orders, you get a, a residual payments tracker. So the more wine orders you fulfil, the more money you get at the end of each mm -hmm. year, and then that continues to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go around again. Um, and that's basically it. It's quite mm. simple in its mechanic. Okay, it's worker placement, so you've got a certain number of workers to start with, which you can buy more, depending on what you want to do, and train them up, um, which obviously costs an action and some money and blah, blah, blah. Um, so you can this, eventually you can get this army of workers for you, which is great. So obviously the more actions you make, the better, the more advantages you have, but obviously it costs you more money to do that, mm -hmm. depending on what strategy mm -hmm. you want. So there's to a balance in there that you've got to get right. Exactly, yes. Um, and is it all just based on everyone's individual choices or do choices that you make as a player affect other people and vice versa? The latter, because it depends on the number of players. Um, there are, for each action you want to take, so you can either say, draw a vine card, you have to put your, your, your worker meeple onto one of the draw, action, draw cards or build something. Mm -hmm. And there are three spaces on each one of these action types, with a, possibly with a couple of exceptions. And you can only put one ever one meeple on one space. So if somebody's taken that space up, you can't take you can't do that action. Yeah. Now everyone gets a sort of a, a mega meeple, which <laughs> um, tell me they've got a cape. <laughs> <laughs> no, sadly. Now the version I've got is actually the essential edition. So it includes four of the twelve expansions that come in what's called in Tuscany which is like the, the expansion oh, right, for okay. it. so it includes so, a few of those yeah. and that's where the Mega Meeple comes from right so in the base version of Mythic Viticulture you don't get that mm -hmm. so I've got a sort of kind of half expanded version of it um, and the Mega Meeple you can place anywhere even if somebody's put a Meeple down but you only get one per, right. time, per year um, but depending on the number of players you get there are more spaces unlocked at each action space and in the second action space um, there's a bonus, so it kind of pays to let somebody go first in that space because then if you put your meeple down, you get a bonus for performing that action. So there's a lot of strategy involved in this. Mm. Um, it's very. I've played it with a two-player and a three-player game, mm -hmm. and the three-player or four-player is very, very different to the two-player game because you get this extra action and you get the bonuses involved. It totally changes the game. Okay. What's the upper limit on players? Six. Six, right, because um, my local gaming group playing Tuesday night, they've been playing this on another table for like two or three weeks now. Yeah. And I keep looking, I'm, not, I'm not allowed on that table, that's the, that's the cube pushers table, I'm, I'm on the dice throwers table, so I'm not, <laughs> we can't mix. <laughs> Basically there's like three of us that bring games and I'm one of the people with the junkie acquisition disorder, mm -hmm. so I've got lots of games, so I bring games and when the guy who owns Viticulture is also one of the other people who brings games. So what yeah. tends to happen is me and him go, do you want to play? Oh, we can't because four of the people have turned up now, right? Me and you split. Yeah. <laughs> so me and him end up playing completely. Never play a game together, ever. You should but, try and get on it. It's a yeah, really good game. It, it does look great. Everyone came away. It's one of those ones that you looked over the table and everyone just nodded sagely, stroking their chin and went, mm. Mm. yes. That was <laughs> enjoyable. Mm. I have to admit, I'm very pleasantly surprised by it. Mm. Because I was expecting... I suppose something similar to Euphoria, which it kind of is, because it's yeah. a worker placement game, but it's a lot less complicated. Um, it's a little more streamlined. 
there's a lot less to take in all in one go when you first start playing. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of ways, it's actually deeper. Right. Um, because I found... It's funny how some of the, the really simple games, like simple strategy sort of games, actually end up being yeah. really quite deep. Like Steve and I played, uh, I can't remember what the name of it was now, that one with the um, into place counters in different places. It was like really small boards. Oh, um, Housing Crisis. Yeah, that was it. Housing Crisis. Now, Housing Crisis was... I don't think that game ever got released. No, possibly not. Um, I got a sense, a pre-production prototype... Um, and I think the intention was it was either going to be released or go on Kickstarter. And I've not seen anything about it since. But the idea was you had a little map of the um, city and a series of people um, which represented like individuals or tokens. You're supposed to be like rival estate agents <laughs> putting people into the various buildings. There was oh, wow. blocks of flats and there was individual houses and each one had a capacity. But there was, I can't remember the rules exactly, but there were things that could block you from doing certain manoeuvres, wasn't there? So there was this yeah, kind of I think you like... had to have a certain number of tokens to claim a particular building or something yeah. along those lines. And so you ha if you didn't get the right number of people in it, then you were essentially wa wasting tokens like, mm. or something like that. But it, you end up starting to, because each building is distinct, so there's like maybe one building's got four tokens spaces, one's got six, and one's got a couple. So you can spend you know, a token in a particular building, but then there's a good chance that if you put one there, then the other person will put a token straight away because it means you can't claim it yeah. right away. Okay. And then what seems like a very simple game, like Noughts and Crosses, <laughs> um, you suddenly so realise that all, it's sort of Noughts and Crosses, but you've got five or six different boards going on at once okay. because you've, kind of, you've got to kind of balance not just where you're going to, whether you're going to claim a particular building, but you might put a token towards claiming a building and then you can work out you know someone else has got to claim that one and then you'll claim that one and then but if you don't do this one here then you lose out in mm. and for something with only probably i don't know that was it five by six or seven wow. squares yeah, it, 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 it was the size of a postcard the board yeah, was tiny. it was a micro game yeah, wow. yeah and, was, and the weird thing was that game changed completely depending on who i played it with really? so it turned up and i played it with amanda and it didn't click. It was just knots and crosses. I'll mm. put one there. I'll then, mm. Yeah, I'll put one there, so therefore I've got to put that one there. So therefore I've got to put that one there. And it just was like two or throw, yep. and nothing happened. Played it with John, and the game changed completely. It then became, I put one over here. Whoa, 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 hang on. You put one over there. Um, why would you do that? Why would you do that? <laughs> do I need to put one over there now? Or do I need to put the on top of it? Do I need to put something in the block of flats or something in the individual house no. to try and get that? Oh, okay. And it changed it completely. The only problem I had with it was, and there's another game recently I reviewed that had the same issue, where you get three turns from the end of the game and you can work mm. out who won the game. Yeah. Yeah. Because okay. how many, what tokens you had left was kind of semi-knowledgeable, wasn't it? Or by then everyone, you knew what was on the board, so you know what three tokens they had left in their hand. Uh, was that it? You had different uh, shapes of tokens, like threes and twos and Yeah, things. it was different numbers of people and each token, so it was different right, size yeah. families. So there was a point where we went to the game and went, Right, well, you've won the round. And you yeah. go, why? Well, because you can only go here, I can only go there. It means you've gone there, you've won. Yeah. Oh, so I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was usually with not the person who's won who would work that out. Yeah. And there was another game I reviewed recently, and I, I'm damned if I can remember the name of it, but it was a similar thing. Mm. You get three quarters of the way through, 90% through the game, and you'd suddenly go, Oh, uh, you've won. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's going to bug me now what the name of that was. Didn't you do that on Read and Trade? Because um, you were about to win Right, ah, right. Well, uh, so that's another one we played recently. I wanted to mention yeah. Read and Trade, actually, because yeah. that is one I'm writing the review for at the moment. And last week we did, we talked about Poseidon's Kingdom. And I was yes. just writing a review at the time, and it helped me cement my opinion. So I, <laughs> I like the idea of talking about a game I'm going to write a review for. So yeah, Raid and Trade... Um, We've all played this one, because yeah. I, I subjected you all to my first attempt at playing this. Um, <laughs> it was a while ago, but yeah. It yeah. Was, it was. So, post-apocalyptic world, um, the main aim of the game is to raid dwellings which are spread over this cityscape, and the idea is you need to gain either favour, skill, or complete quests. Which, if you gain all these, you are allowed into the Golden City, which is the aim of the game. Which you forgot mm -hmm. to set up when we first played it. No, the, no, no, the outpost, I forgot to Oh, the outpost, yeah. okay, the outpost, sure, sure. Um, It's a weird game. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a fair... Uh... Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's, um, there's a bit of a fallout feel to it, 
because the whole idea is you raid these dwellings to get these resources and the resources are things like food, ammunition, gears, electronics mm -hmm. and you can craft items from them and one of the ways of winning is crafting enough items to get your engineering skill up to 20 and you would. Mm -hmm. The other way is to collect quests which was you'll get given a quest card and you have to do certain things around the board and then the other one was gain favour which we found really difficult because as you said I forgot to set up the outpost which is the way you gain favour. <laughs> um, that's a minor oversight but it's interesting what you said there because we almost had an exact repeat of it where we thought somebody had won. If you remember we said yeah. oh John's won and then somebody else in the same time went no I won. Yes, yes. <laughs> that, that somebody was you, Mr. Tudor. Yeah. <laughs> I that, think you used that exact same voice. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually... But yeah. the times I've played it since, the exact same thing has happened. Yeah. So someone has gone, someone has gone, hang on, you're on 20 skill. You, you, you've nearly won. All you need to do is spend this energy because mm. you, you always have to spend oh, energy right, yeah. to win. And, then, and everyone concentrates like hell on trying to stop this person. Mm. And as they're doing this, one other person turns later and goes, um, I've won. What? <laughs> <laughs> Which makes me think this may actually be the most well-designed and balanced game in the world ever. <laughs> Although, or, or, or is it just fluke? Although those uh, sorts of things, um, I think that sort of thing quite often turns up in Talisman. I mean, okay, it takes, you know, a day to get to, <laughs> to, get to that point. But you do quite often find, um, you know, there's sort of two or three people are in the running for the end game. And then everyone gets worried about the person who's at the forefront or the fact that I'm in the game. <laughs> mm. uh, so they sort of concentrate on just discouraging that person from having any chance of doing it while someone else just, you know, sneaks in from behind and goes, oh, I've, uh, I've won actually. Right, yeah, I've won. Excuse me, what? <laughs> what a foo. Uh, so what did you guys think of Raid and Trade? Because you've all played it. I know it was the first game you played and it was a bit of a learning game, but what were your it thoughts was... on it? I don't know, it seemed very slow to start with because everyone's obviously sort of trying to work out a how it works but mm. that aside it seemed like you kind of race out of the gate because you're stuck in the middle don't you mm -hmm. yeah everyone sort of disappears off in different directions yeah it's, it's yeah. obviously a solo game and then you start building things up it's almost like a game of two maybe three stages um, where everyone's sort of doing their own thing and looting and looting and looting until you run out of things to loot. Or and at least you... the resources are starting to ebb and you suddenly think, oh, we need a bit of strategy now. Exactly, yeah. that's <laughs> exactly it. And you kind of think, bugger, um, right, who kind of stab? <laughs> <laughs> who's nearest? Actually, it doesn't matter who's nearest, who's got what I need? Yeah. <laughs> at which point the person who's got what you need suddenly thinks, bollocks and then <laughs> runs away so i don't know it was uh, you, you, to it your your exasperation there kind of sums up how i feel about it it's yeah it's kind of a bit middly we yeah. like to describe it well, what do you think john i think i'd want to play it a couple more times to be yeah. sure mm. um, like i don't i think we only sort of scratched the surface of it yeah to some extent mm, mm. um but it was it didn't. It didn't make me. It didn't blow me away instantly. And I just thought, yeah, you know, this is a great game. I definitely want to play this. Didn't get excited in that way, but at the same time, I did enjoy it. Mm. You know, I definitely give it another shot or two. Mm. So yeah, uh, I'm also feeling quite mixed about it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think that's, that seems to be the consensus of most people who played it. No one went, oh god, that's awful. I'm not playing it again. But at the same time, everyone kind of went, all right, I'll give it another try. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's either some definitely some hidden depth in strategies that can go on. I would agree with that. Or yeah. it'll always play out that way and you can never predict who's going to win until the last game and then... Yeah. <laughs> it almost kind of suggests, I mean, from what you've said, that, you know, there's one person who looks, oh, they're going to win in this game when we played it, it was John. So I went after John to try to punch him in the face and stop, at which point you surreptitiously won. But you played with someone else, the same thing happened, but maybe with somebody else. Yeah, it was two it's other players, yeah. It's almost to sort of say there's no point in making it trying to win straight away mm. yeah. just wait and see what happens yeah. yeah which kind of surely runs against the idea of trying to win the game i don't know don't maybe well, it's a strategy. There, are, there are some games where that is the strategy don't mm. be overt um yeah yeah but as, as john says may, maybe it's it's one of these things that you need to play a few times to try and get the subtle nuances of mm. softly softly catchy monkey and all that i don't know yeah. moving on then john you played anything um, not really. 
I did think about breaking out um, Neuroshima Hex on my phone recently, just so that I had something to talk about here, but funnily enough, just like all the other games, never really quite got around to it. Uh, so, um, what I will talk about, um, there's a couple of things. One, I, I keep meaning to, um, to get Andy to play Munchkin. Yeah, what is Munchkin? So Munchkin, well, there's a couple of variants, and I've got the board game and the card game. Um, the board game is complicated, and every time I play it, I always get at least one or two of the rules wrong. We realise towards the end <laughs> uh, that I've stuffed up something. Whereas the card game, um, we have got a much better handle on. And the, the basic idea, I think the tagline is something like, um, uh, kill the monsters, uh, take the loot, stab your buddies in the back. You which, have a game, though. Which is definitely yeah. Yeah, up, up my street. I can see why you like it. So uh, the real aim of the game is to basically make your character reach um, level 10. So you start off as a level 1... Uh, a level one player with no class, haha. -ha. <laughs> that's that's in the rules, and the, and the rules are like that throughout. Really, really funny, uh, funny rules, funny um, cards, and all the um, all, all the stuff that you have to encounter. Right. So basically, you take it in turns to turn over um, a door card, which will either be an encounter or some uh, you know cool item that makes your character better. It might be um, uh, the pantyhose of strength or. Uh, <laughs> The bastard sword, which is yeah. No. <laughs> um, there's all sorts of things. There, there's lots of little um, play on words like that. Okay, um, sounds quite fun. Yeah, it's it is definitely good fun. Uh, and a lot of the cards, uh, if you encounter a monster, you then have to try and fight that monster. But rather than be like you know rolling a dice or, um, it's based on the number of cards that you've got face up have all got sort of uh, like worth to them. So they'll give you like plus one oh. or plus two. There's no like different attributes, it's just plus one or plus two. And if you've got more numbers than the monster, then you win. Except okay. what you do to say that is you might have a level 10 dragon or something up there. I'm a level nine, so then I'd play like a potion of something that would help me. Oh. Uh, but then everyone else, you can't, when, when you play that, you say, I'm gonna beat this dragon in one, two, three, and if no one plays anything, then you've beaten it, it's okay. Except that if someone else plays something, then uh, adds the dragon. it adds the dragon. Right. So you might find that he's got a buddy. There's actually two of them. Ooh. Or it's an ancient uh, dragon with a buddy. And depending on how vicious people are, they can keep adding up these, <laughs> oh God. these stuff you cards. <laughs> <laughs> so if it all becomes a bit too bad, you can then ask someone else in the game um, whether they'd like to come in and help you. Right. Uh, which, is, which can help, um, but they tend to want a share in the loot. So then you negotiate to see how much of the loot, you know, they, they might take the first pick of the loot card and then you get the third one or something. Okay, so I can just imagine you having this raging battle with a massive great dragon whilst negotiating the terms of our agreement. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, yeah. and the heat of battle, I like it. But then it, it's quite interesting as well because as soon as you get a few people playing it, um, you might find that one person, you like a low level, car low level person, mm. they're, they're quite happy, other people would be quite happy if someone else helped them. If a couple of low level players help each other, it's no odds to uh, you know someone who's towards the end of the game, but if someone else who's high level suddenly comes on board, then that's a, that sort of group party suddenly becomes a target, and suddenly people start playing all their nasty cards. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, I so think I might enjoy that. It's good fun. I'm going to offer a contrary opinion. Mm. Uh -huh. I'm not a massive fan of this game. Really? I think it's got a couple of flaws in it. Explain. Um, the biggest problem is as soon as somebody becomes level 9, so you've got to get level 10 to win, haven't you? That's right, yeah. So you get to level 9, then everyone just gangs up on you. Your target. <laughs> Your target. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other problem is the only way the game ends is if someone gets to level 10. Mm -hmm. So if you go for the deck, you just reshuffle it. Which means the game can take a lot longer than you first expect. I see. So I rather see. than being a half hour game, it can last two or three hours <laughs> if you're playing with the right nastiest bunch. <laughs> because everyone just stops whoever's at level nine. Oh Lord. I think a couple of games have done it a bit better. Right. Okay. Similar idea. That the one I played with John a few times, Epic Death. Yeah, that was quite good. Epic Death is a similar kind of thought train to it, but I think it does it a lot better because it has a definite beginning, middle and end. Yeah, mm. that's a fair point. Mm. Um, to, to be fair though, I've never had... Well, I probably do allow <laughs> more time to play Munchkin, but I've, I don't think I've ever had a point where, um, you know, we've had a Munchkin game that's gone on for, you know, more than probably half an hour to mm. an hour or so. 
that's good. It, it depends probably what your expectations have been yeah. to some extent. Mm. It, it's one of those games, it's a bit of a weird one because it's probably one of the biggest selling board games. Really? Of, uh, of the last 10, 15 years. It's one of those things, I think everyone at some point has bought Munchkin. Mm. And there's like 101 expansions, all of which don't need to be mixed in with the base set. You can just grab any old Munchkin and grab it. Right, right. yeah. But at the same time, it's one of those ones that people who consider themselves hardcore board gamers look down the nose on it a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, could, I could see that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's kind of one of the reasons why I was quite happy to get John on this podcast, because I know it's a really popular game, and I know... I'm not a massive fan of it, but I didn't want three of us that all go, yeah, we all love this game, we wanted a bit of discussion. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bit of variation. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I suspect, yeah, I mean, John loves stabbing the back games. And I can see the attraction, yes. I have to admit. I wouldn't, just for the record, <laughs> I'm, I'm not an exclusive, uh, you know, if a game doesn't involve hurting your mates, um, I'm not going to like it. But I think... If, there, if there's some um, element of competition, I quite like that in a game, between mm. between the players. And I also quite like uh, games where there's some element of something can randomly go wrong. Where it's not just, if you've played this game enough, you know all the strategies, you're always going to win. Mm. Yeah. I like it when there's an, ele an element of chance in there. So yeah. no matter how good you are, there's still a reasonably good chance that someone's going to mm. you know, mm. do something horrible to you, even if they didn't mean to. A bit like uh, Robo Rally. <laughs> ah yes. Yes, I like Robo. <laughs> it's a good game that one. So um, the premise for that one, um, you've each taken control of a little robot and you've got to guide him through a, um, a little a little maze essentially um, over a series of flags, and you've got to try and avoid other people's robots in the process. Cool. So uh, everyone gets dealt nine cards, and each of those cards will be something like move forwards one, move forwards three, turn right, turn left, go backwards, that sort of thing. And without knowing what anyone else is going to do either, other than you can see where other people's robots are on the board and what flags they've got to get to, uh, you've got to pick five of those cards uh, to decide where to send your robot this turn. And whatever you do, once you pick those five, that's what your robot will do, even if you get the order wrong. There's all sorts of obstacles in there as well, in the maze, so oh. you might have little travelator things that shift your robot around, there are pits, uh, you can drive off the side of the board, you can get shot by lasers, and at the end of each of these card phases, um, your robot shoots a laser out the front of it as well. So anything in front of it that isn't blocked by a piece of scenery also gets shot. <laughs> which oh, that's right, yes. which uh, doesn't mean instant death, by the way. Um, it just makes life <laughs> a little bit more difficult. <laughs> so, so you pick your five cards, and then off you go, and everyone turns over their first card, and they've all got a little number on them that says which one goes first. So the highest number goes first. So if your robot um, is going to go in the same place as another robot, um, whoever gets there first is fine. The second robot then when they move, assuming that there's nothing blocking them, they'll then push, their robot will complete its move and push the, the robot that got there first out of the way. Out of the way. Uh -huh. So suddenly their carefully laid plans, <laughs> which might involve, you know, carefully skirting around a pit or avoiding that laser, yeah. it suddenly all goes to it, pot. It's <laughs> over apex. It's That's a it. game I love, but it's one of the most frustrating it's games serious. I know. Yes. Yeah. Because no. Number one, you've got the programming aspect, so know some, and, and, and you've got the spatial awareness because you've got to, you've got to program it like forward to left, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. and there are people who can't get their head around that. Well, no. even even those of us who yeah. are engineers and software engineers still yeah. sit there just turning their head to the right and then moving their hands across, and then you can see them just working out. You can almost work out the route they're taking yeah, by watching how their heads wiggle. Yeah. <laughs> so you're doing that. I just play a card. Yeah, he's going left. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. There's, there's several ways in which it can get screwed up. It can get screwed up oh, because yeah. you've put something wrong, and then as you said, you can get knocked off target. And then when you start yeah. taking damage, some of these programs get locked in. Yeah, so every so every point of damage you take, you lose one extra card. Yeah. So to begin with, you get nine cards to pick from. Once you've taken four points of damage, you've then only got the five cards. All you get to do is pick which order they go in. Mm. And if you take another point of damage for each point of damage beyond there, uh, each card that was in that register on that turn gets locked you can't you can't change it so your robot will forever now be going right at the end of its turn and then your robot will always be going backwards one and then turning right at the end of it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> until it all yeah. goes wrong you can repair and you get upgrades and things but yeah essentially it's um it's, it's got a good mix of um an option to try and knock people off course although sometimes 
if you go all out trying to do that, you can find yourself completely overshooting and <laughs> <laughs> it, it can go just as wrong for you as it could for them. <laughs> yeah, it does, because I remember it's one of the, it's probably one of the first board games I played, like not sort of non-monopoly or non-traditional board games I played actually with, 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 with John actually. Mm -hmm. Um, turns out I won, actually, in that game. But, <laughs> oh, um, I like I said, games with a bit of chance. <laughs> <in them. laughs> um, but no, I really enjoyed it. I just, I'd just forgotten half of the mechanics. I was trying to think, because I was thinking about it the other day. But yeah, I really quite like this. I should get my hands on it. Um, but I was trying to work out in my head, like, well, surely if you've just got perfect strategy, how did the random element come in? And I couldn't remember for the life of me how it went. But of course, every card's got a, a kind of a, an impetus, not an impetus, um, an importance. An to importance, it. yeah, kind of a you know, I'm gonna priority. Go priority yes. also yes. Well, thank you. Yes. Um and then that's obviously where it where it comes in. Mm. No, it's a good one. Didn't help the last time I played this I'd had a bit too much to drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So last, sure, surely not. Yeah, the last time I played this was at John's cottage up in Scotland. So John's got this little well your, your, your grandparents, is it? Or, a family owned yeah, yeah. family owned cottage on this remote wing of Scotland. It, it quite literally is the arse end of nowhere because I think it takes half an hour to drive to the nearest corner shop. Pretty much, yeah. You drive, yeah. drive up to Loch Lomond, turn left and then drive until you run out of road. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's quite literally the end of the road. Yeah. So it's this old schoolhouse about 100 yards from the beach. Yeah. Mm. There's there's a little there's electricity there, but you feel as if someone wanted to use it sparingly. Is there's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's, there's some light bulbs and that's it. Well, that, just, just, the cable, just the cable get thinner the further away from the road you get. Actually, there is there are some cottages down the road, and when their underfloor heating kicks in, the lights do flicker. Wow, <laughs> so uh, that's proper rule. So uh, we go there. You go there every year, don't you? At least once a year. Pretty much. Yeah. Every so often, you bring a whole bunch of people with you. So we all went along, and invariably, what happens is. After once it goes dark, yeah, all the board games come out, mm. beers come out, and then John's bramble whiskey comes out, <laughs> which is whiskey imbued with lots of um, blackberries. Blackberries, yeah, that's good stuff. That. I had about three of them, I think. Oh. And then, funnily enough, I couldn't program my robot anymore. He <laughs> <laughs> kept falling off the edge of the boat. It's <laughs> remarkably similar to John's professional life, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's all part of my ongoing strategy. <laughs> if you can't be good, make sure everyone else is drunker than you are. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I played two games you might like, John, because both of them have a bit of randomness and both of them involve stabbing people in the back. Excellent. So, the simplest of the two was Cash and Guns. Okay. So, this is. What's the, that about then? Um, <laughs> funny enough, it's about cash and you use guns. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yes. Who'd have thought it? So, you, it's like a cartoonified version of. Um, not Pulp Fiction, what was the one before that? Um, Reservoir Dogs. Wild dogs. Mm. So you're all on this heist, and all the riches are laid out in front of you, and you all have a foam gun. <laughs> Representing <laughs> nine actual mil foam gun. Actual foam gun. Wow. I like this already. Whoever is <laughs> yeah. the Dom counts to three, and everyone, after three, points their gun at the person they're going to shoot. Wow. <laughs> okay. The Dom then gets to make one person move. And then at any point, anyone can duck out and basically dive out and not take any of the loot from this round of the heist. Right. Um, you've then got you've got bullet cards, so not your, your gun isn't full of bullets. You've got clicks and you've got bangs. Right. Now there's two ways of playing it, and I played it both ways. One way is you strategically say, right, I'm going to put that card this round, and it could be a click, it could be a bang, but you know what it is, so you're. So there's some strategy there's behind some strategy. Yeah, okay. well, The other way is just shuffle them and just deal them randomly and you don't know what you're going to get. Oh god, that could be chaos. <laughs> yeah it is! Mm. But I thought sort of, John would like that, it's the kind of game... If... So what happens when... What happens when you that? go, yeah. yeah. So just shoot each other in the face or... Well, yeah, but what, what, what happens like? is, unless you can duck out, mm. so you can say, right, I'm, you knock over your little standard character, you've got this little cardboard standy, mm -hmm. knock him over, you say, I'm out, you t put your gun away because you're not shooting anyone now. Everyone who's still in the game reveals what bullet, they, whether they've got an empty chamber or you know, a click mm -hmm. or, or a shot. Mm. And then any one shot takes a wound and gets knocked down as well. Okay. And then whoever's left in the round then yes, takes yes, it yes. in order to take a, a pick of his uh, okay. the loot. Right, How I many see. wounds do you get in total? Uh, three. So, you can, presumably there are more than three rounds. There's, uh, I can't remember, six or eight rounds. Okay, so that obviously you can't stay in every round, you've got to make sure that you duck out some rounds. Yeah, and, and then it's like, right, he shot twice, 
Has he got any more bullets left in that gun, or is he, you know, can I risk it? I'm going to risk it! Oh, he's got a gun. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the, that's a nice simple game that takes about 20 minutes to play. Okay, that's pretty good. The other game I played takes about four to five hours, which is Game of Thrones, the board game. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, Has oh. it actually finished yet? Is he still writing it? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I've never actually properly finished the game. I don't there think. you go. We've always called it after like four hours and oh gone. Lord. This could this could take too long. Well, you're supposed to play ten rounds, or until the aim is you're supposed to capture seven castles on the board. So you got this board is this beautiful map of Westeros. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. I've actually got two copies of the board because one of them was damaged and part of me is tempted to frame it and put it on the wall because it looks that nice. nice. Wow. Even the damaged one? <laughs> no, not the damaged one. The damaged oh, okay. one is damaged because I bought it and I took it to game night being sacrificial and my sister-in-law spilt a bottle of WKD on it as well. So... <laughs> two questions arise from that. Yeah. One, why was she drinking near the board? Two, why was she drinking WKD? <laughs> uh, answer one, we're playing in a pub Okay. And well, surely there's, there's an extra table. Well, no, no, it's quite tight. And to be okay. fair, to me, with me, drinking and board games kind of go together. So I've true. always got. Yeah, I don't see why I should separate those. Two. Yeah, well, it's true. Well, to be fair, I we mean, just played Pandemic Legacy. We were surrounded by beer. Yeah. And to be fair, most of the Talisman game that I've got has at some point had a mixture of wine, beer, <laughs> <laughs> Framber <Fremble> whiskey. <laughs> It's got a multitude of colours then. Yes. It does. Some of the cards are definitely um, tagged, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing is, my uh, sister-in-law only drinks WKD. She doesn't drink anything else. I didn't realise they were still making that stuff. No, no, I didn't either. Uh, to, to those that may be overseas and that are British, um, WKD is an Alcopop. So it's a bottled alcoholic beverage. It's it very sweet. Very, very and it, ta sweet. it tastes mostly artificial. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's bright blue. Yeah. I most mean, of them are. You can yeah, there's most of them are blue wickets, yeah, so there's a pale yeah, that's, sky blue colour. Yeah, that was yeah. it. it was the you blue can one. get other ones. It wasn't the blue one. one. No, that's vile <laughs> stuff. It looks like Whereas the blue, blue one's delicious. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Relatively, it is. <laughs> But it's it's you know it's it's like the difference between choosing between the cat's arse and the dog's arse in terms of, of licking targets. <laughs> neither of those is, is desirable, but you know. Yeah, to be honest, I think I'd rather drink WKD. But um, <laughs> but, but you're right; it's not very nice. No, no. <laughs> Disgusting stuff. Oh, that's put me in completely off course. <laughs> Game of Thrones. Right, Game of Thrones. Yeah. Looking at dogs' ass in less than three seconds. That's <laughs> why I'm here, folks. Yeah. So Game of Thrones. Yes, map of Westeros. Must capture seven castles. Um, Presumably, they are the seven kingdoms. Then they. Yes. Well, the, the, there are more than seven castles on the board. I think there are. Okay. Uh, I, I, I can't remember. I'll get it wrong. Um, but you play as one of the six houses. Now, slight spoiler if you've not seen Game of Thrones or read the books, it's set. I don't think that's likely given the, the, the target audience. Just, just warning someone. Just <laughs> up up in to case. season how many? Uh, right, <laughs> so halfway through the first season or first book. So right, the, fine, the yeah. game is set at the point when Robert Baratheon dies. Mm -hmm. <gasps> he dies? <Yes. laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. Dumbledore! <laughs> no! Yeah. She's a man, it's a sled, <laughs> he's his father. <laughs> anyway, so at that point it kicks off and it's a lot like Risk if you look at it. So you've right, got knights yeah. and footmen and siege engines on the board and the idea is you move these troops along and move them around and try and grab these territories. Oh. A bit like Risk. A bit like Risk. Six player game, you can play it with four but it works best with six because then you've got full board oh, is it limited depending on players okay yeah the, the, it knocks down to four and what you basically do is just start knocking off um, blocking off kingdoms mm -hmm. okay <clears throat> excuse me so the beauty of it is everyone has got two neighbors and at hmm. some point you're going to have to make an alliance with one neighbor and fight the other one because you can't really fight both of them otherwise like you'd it. be completely minced right so at certain points in the board, like in the film, in the film, sorry, the TV programs in the book, they always keep talking about the neck. You know, you're, all these battles happen at the neck, and when you look yeah, at this okay. board, you go, right, well, that's why all the battles happen at the neck because half the armies need to get to the south, and that's the only place they can do it. Yeah. So everyone's going to have a fight there. Mm. And 
it's really thematic. It's got this really clever system where um, you give out orders to every miniature on the, every unit on the board, mm -hmm. and one of the orders is a support, which basically means they add their strength to any neighbouring battles. But you can add strength to any battle. Right. So if two pilbara players are fighting, random scrap. yeah, basically, yeah. If, if if you, you two are fighting edge, over yeah. a neighbouring thing, and I've got support token, then you both go right. Well, I've got four points worth of troops. You've got five points worth of troops. Steve got three. Steve, who are you <laughs> supporting in this battle? Yeah. And which well, I go well. Uh, which of you has just attacked me and taken my biggest fortress? Uh, <laughs> what's it worth? <laughs> Sweet petty revenge is mine. Excellent. Yes. More importantly, all their breasts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no. Go with probably not. <laughs> no. no. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not that true to the, to, to the TV show, then, is it? <laughs> no. To be fair, it was actually made about five or six years before the TV show came out. Really? Yeah. It's so it's more thing. faithful to the books than yeah. Um, the TV show. It got re the, the version I've got is the second edition, which came out. Not long after the TV show got famous, you know, you can see Fancy Flight Games kind of went and gone. We've got hold of a really powerful license here, let's mm. make some more money out of it. Mm. Um, but no, the, it's weird because most of the artwork was drawn before the TV program came out as well. Right. So it's someone else's different interpretation of okay. what the characters oh, are. Okay. Oh, okay. So How different you... are they? Um, some of them are quite different. Um, the, t the Lannisters all look very different to what they are in the TV program, but at the same okay. time, that's close to what they are in the book. Right. However, the Brian of Tarth card mm -hmm. is exactly the same as the actress that played wow, really? wow. Gwendolyn Christie. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. looks exactly like her. And you think, hang on, was the copyright notice on this? This was actually, yeah, it was drawn before she was cast. That's in the impressive. Role. It was wow. really impressive. That's impressive. <laughs> We've made a role for you. Yeah. <laughs> Please take the job. <laughs> now, we play this at my game group, and now everyone at my game group wants to have a rematch against my wife. <laughs> because my wife made the most amazing move in the world ever and won the game. So oh, basically Steve, I just lost the game. I you just made all of our viewers lose the game. Sorry well, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, how could you? <laughs> oh, sorry. Anyway, so Amanda was playing the Starks, which means you basically hold the north, you have the largest amount of territory, you can gain the most influence, but you oh. have the fewest castles. And throughout the game, she basically just held her borders. Mm -hmm. Was didn't look to be a massive in forces, but at the same time wasn't moving forward, but stopping people from moving north. Mm. And every time Stop the fight, piling. yeah, every time <laughs> a, a, a fight started to get there, she kind of just politely, just you know, made you a nice board. Stop that, please. And everyone kind of started to ignore her, which was a very stupid decision. <laughs> because on the final turn, now bear in mind, you can only really got limited orders you can place. So like, mm -hmm. you can only do three march orders, you can only move three units a turn. Mm -hmm. And in fact, some players may be limited, you can only do two. And she managed to take the Erie and King's Landing in three moves. Whoa. So she moved one ship south, which allowed ships allowed her to move much faster around the board, mm -hmm. and that was what her first move. Second move took the Erie, which is like the most fortified city on the board. It's mm. the most difficult to take, and everyone went, okay. Oh, Second move <laughs> took King's Landing off the person who was in the lead, so they lost a point and she gained a point. And she went, done. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff you guys, I'm going. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, that sounds like Amanda. Yeah. <laughs> nice. That sounds good. So uh, I have to acquire that. Yeah, well, I, I, so I've got a copy. It's, it's time to get a well-worn copy. It's one of those games that you look at on the shelf. I think it was 60 quid when it came out. Oh, ouch! So you know, we discussed last week about the price of fancy flight games. Yeah, and how you look at it and then you open it and you go, oh, it's so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at that game and it said three to six players. And at a time when we wasn't going to the gaming group as much, mm. and I was looking at it going, 60 pounds. Me and Amanda can't play it against each other because it's three players. I'm never going to get this to the table. But Amanda was like, well, you've just been paid. It's Game of Thrones. You'll find yeah, someone to play know. it. Go on, <laughs> treat yourself. <laughs> it's now probably one of the most played games I own. Really? Wow, yeah, cool. it comes out every every three or four months. It comes out, get six people to play it. The unfortunate means that every time I bring it out, I've got to teach the damn thing again. Yeah, but mm. you're good at that, Steve. So, <laughs> you are. Yeah. But that's, yeah. again, it's that fancy flight game of being bloody complicated as well. Mm. I always have that horrifying moment, uh, more horrifying than Arkham Horror, um, when I, I go to play Arkham Horror with a group of people who I haven't played it with before, who, who are new to probably board gaming in the sense that 
we sort of geeking mm. uh, board gamers would think. Um, and Steve's not there to explain the rules. Because <laughs> I always get stuff wrong, and I, I normally only get a couple of things wrong, but they're normally crucial things like, you know, one and a half inches per cyclone missile. Or <laughs> but something that's game changing for the rest of it, and you get towards the end and think, there's something, something wasn't right about this game. Oh, uh, I didn't have Steve here. <laughs> <laughs> Preparation, that's what it is, it's preparation. Yeah, that's it, yeah. The game's master. Yeah. Universal yeah. head sheets, that's what you need. Mm. If you're never quite sure. Are there any expansions to Game of Thrones, or just, just doesn't need them? Because right. it's been around for a few years. There are, <coughs> the second edition, which is the one I've got, there are two expansions. But they're fancy flight print on demand expansions. So they get enough pre-orders then? They're, they're, they're a bit order. weird, it's... In the UK, they're really difficult to find in the shops. Okay. Mm. Uh, but a friend of mine, every so often, puts an order in for some of these things, and he'll get everyone he knows to say, "Right, I'm going to put an order in," because shipping is it's one of those things that the more you spend, the less the shipping becomes. Sure. Mm. So every so often, he just says, "Right, I'm putting an order in." Steve, you need the Game of Thrones expansions, don't you? Wink. Wink. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah. yeah go on. Okay, go on then. And they're not they're not expensive. So the first one. Uh, changes the setup. So the basic game, it's almost like the first two turns of a tutorial because you're just in your castle, your your home, and you expand for the first couple of turns. Mm -hmm. Whereas the first expansion sets it, I think, in the third book. So okay. everyone starts in completely different places, but everyone owns all the boards covered at that point. So right. it kicks off straight away. So I'm trying to remember what happens in the third book now. Is that well, the one let's not spin? spoil it just in case. Yeah. 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 Series, yeah, series three or four, it's about that point. Mm. And then the second expansion, I can't remember where it is, but it changes one of the houses. So you, um, I think you get Tully and the ones in the area, I can't remember what they're called, but they, they change the houses around so you actually get different houses with different cards. Oh, right. Um, but it also puts missions in. So it's set up as a, that's a four player game only. You can't play that six houses, you can put the four houses. Mm. And it does things well. Normally, you just have to conquer castles. This will say, right, you have to conquer this castle, and everyone has to try and conquer this castle this turn. Okay. And then you get more points depending on, you know, if, if you start the opposite end of Westeros to where this castle is, you might get four victory points for it, and somebody else was next just to it only gets one. Gets one. Right, yeah. Okay, yeah. It's really clever, actually. Both expansions really require you to have played the game before. Makes mm. sense, yeah. Yeah, oh, good. mainly because the basic game has that couple of rounds where you're kind of right learning and moving out and mm. trying to get your head around it. I quite like that when you get expansions that do change, fundamentally change the game. Mm. 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 Like, so, I mean, I've got Talisman and probably, I think I've only shy of maybe two or three expansions. <laughs> mm. uh, but it's so rare that we actually play with more than maybe one or two of them in, in yeah, effect. Yeah, you mix it yeah. in as you need them, yeah. But but a lot of those do. I mean, we quite often play one of the endings, which is Hand of Doom, um, just because uh, it fundamentally changes the game. So it's not just race to the middle and then kill everyone else until you're the last one left. Mm -hmm. It's race to the middle and then roll a dice and see whether everyone, everyone loses, one person wins, <laughs> that person nice. dies and has to roll a new character. Yeah. It just adds that element of... Um, it could all be for, for naught. <laughs> mm. That's good. Mashikaro does that actually in its expansion. It's um, what's Mashikaro? It's a it's a card game. It's not an actual board game, um, but you're the mayor of a town. Okay. And the idea is that you're supposed to build a certain number of landmarks. And once you've built all four, to start with, it's four landmarks. But the ex the um, the expansion adds two, three more landmarks, mm -hmm. just more, more to do so the game lasts a little bit longer. And in order to do that, you need to add facilities to your town, like just things like wheat fields, bakeries, vineyards, uh, various commercial establishments, because all on little cards. But every turn you roll the dice, and each card has a number on it, mm -hmm. and it's activated by the, the dice roll. So you don't activate all the cards in one go. Okay. So it's a bit like Dominion, in yeah. a way, in the sense that you, you're building a hand, essentially. Um, it sounds like Sim City in cards. <laughs> kind of, but not really. It's much simpler than that, It's a lot really. simpler. Um, yeah. you can, in, in the base game, you can basically choose, because um, there's up to two dice, and one of your landmarks uh, can activate a second die. So in the first, for the first few turns, 
you're limited to a single die, so one mm -hmm. six. So there's not much point in building sorry, anything with an activation number of seven or more. Mm -hmm. um, although you can't keep one, but obviously. Um, but then you can activate one of your, you can build one of your landmarks for money. So basically most of these cards generate money in some form or other. Okay. Either be it from taking it from other people for doing things or you just get it from the bank or whatever. And they're multiplicative, so if you've got more than one of each one, obviously they, they all add together. Um, some cards rely on having uh, other cards, so you get things, facilities um, that basically are activated for everybody who rolls a dice. Mm -hmm. You've got um, things like um, shops, which are activated only on your turn, but can be multiplied by things like, so if you've got bakery, for example, that might take advantage of wheat fields that you've got. So the more wheat fields you've got, and the more bakeries you've got, the more right, money okay. you get. So it's, it, it works it's like a lot. multiplying factor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can also get things like, um, almost like franchises. So if you've got, say, like a burger joint, mm -hmm. if somebody activates that, you actually get money off the person who activated the card. Right. As okay. if they're visiting, there's things like that. And you also get commercial things, which are like sort of, you can only have one of each, but they're very, very powerful. So you can say, right, I'm actually going to take you know, that card off you, mm -hmm. uh, which you, you discard at the commercial establishment, things like that. And ultimately, the idea is you just basically activate all of these landmarks. The first, the sort of the base game, um, as you're going along, your turn consists of essentially um, rolling dice to activate your card, buying a card you want to do, and. and um, Finally, you got the money. Provided you got the money, yeah. Obviously, mm -hmm. cooping money. So you, you you get you roll the dice, you activate. You're sort of balancing how much money you've got to what you can. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you roll the dice, you activate your or your opponent's uh, cards, you get the money from that, and then you can decide to build something. And mm -hmm. now you can either build one of your landmarks if you've got the money to do it, or you can choose more likely to build a facility of some description. Mm -hmm. Now, in the base game, you can essentially choose to build whatever facility you want. So it's almost a race, right? almost, depending on what strategy you want to use. However, in the expansion... Well, Steve I doesn't look convinced you by know, that. No, it's, it's, it's the word almost. I'd say it is a race. It's just, well, okay. yeah, yeah, build yeah, those things is. as quickly as you can. I mean, stra the, the strategy in it is trying to work out which dice rolls are going to cut more often. Yeah. And so some cards allow you to steal coins off of one, some get you whenever that dice is rolled. That yes, it's just, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've only got the base game, I haven't got the expansions, I'm interested in the two the actually. There's uh, the Harbour expansion, which is the first one, which massively changes the game. And this is why this is why I mentioned it when you mentioned you know, some expansions change the game. Mm -hmm. The harbour expansion for it adds lots more landmarks. So instead of building four, I think it is in the first the, first, the base game, you end up building so sort of like six or seven. Right. But you get one automatically, which is I think the mayor's house or civic hall or something like that. And if you've got any, if you don't have any money in your turn, you get one coin. Mm -hmm. um, so it always means you've got a bit of money. So you can always build something really basic if you really want to. Um, but it changes the you can build whatever structure you want so it stops it being a race and it makes essentially a market for which structures are available so you can deal oh, 10 right. car 10 piles out right okay um, i can see yeah so it limits the the available buildings that you can choose from you might have more than one available in one particular type so you've got 10 piles essentially some might have only one in it some might have more than one depending on what's what gets what gets dealt out at the start of the game and if somebody buys one they've got to replenish it if they deplete that pile okay. the discards so it really really changes the game and it really makes it a lot more interactive and it stops it being it's less of a race and more of a well actually i'm going to take that one maybe not because it's going to help me immediately yeah, but it's yeah, going to yeah. stop my opponent yeah. getting something okay yeah. so it makes it a lot more interactive and it stops it being three people just trying to race to race to the finish mm -hmm. the millionaires row um is slightly more of the same it builds on harbour you can play it without harbour but i think it's better with it um and laura and i have gone through this quite a few times now um with base game with harbour and then then millionaire so mm -hmm. we've done it all three millionaire adds things like uh, renovations and it adds a few more facilities and things like vineyards or wineries 
and if you activate the winery, you get a load of money, but you instantly have to renovate it because it represents the fact that you don't make wine overnight. So you've got to, you've got to renovate it. So you've got to, when you renovate something, okay. it's essentially okay. kind of you miss a turn. So if you activate something that's renovated, you remove the renovation token, but you don't gain the bonus for the card. Right. So essentially missing a turn. Yeah. There are some facilities that you can buy that force renovations onto other players. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah. If they're activated. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's there's a lot there's a lot to it actually. I think the millionaires thing and so certainly the harbour is the biggest change it introduces mm. in, in the sense of the market. But then the millionaires one adds the kind of bastard factor. <laughs> See, I was everyone got... looking at me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've got the I said I've got the the original uh, Machikuro. Um, I think Amanda picked it up because she played it and really loved it because she likes Japanesey things as well. So it's very pretty. It's very pretty. It's very it Japanese is. as well. And um, I just, yeah, I felt it was lacking in a real decision. Mm. Um, some people, when they, they talk about these things, they say about meaningful decisions. And I, my thought is, it's actually more a decision I care about. No, that's mm. meaningful. And there was a point in that game when sometimes I, I didn't care what I was doing. I was just taking, because I thought, right, I've got four. I'll buy the building worth four. Yeah. Not, I want that because that'll help. You know, I've got... A, I've it's got, difficult to form like a long-term strategy yeah, sort it, of thing. It, 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 well, there was no strategy, as, as Andy said, it was yeah. a race. You just kind of thought, right, all I need is enough gold to get these four mm. key points. How you points. go about it is up to you. Yeah. I, there is a certain amount of strategy. There, there, there are options, but I didn't I didn't think they were necessarily a strategy. They you were don't, more you a don't feel of, the need to sit there and, and contemplate oh, oh, the next there was, there was no, moves. Yeah, there no. was no thinking about it. It was Not like, really. I've got five gold, let's you buy can, another farm. You can think of maybe two turns in advance, but because there's a dice roll, you, there's not much point. You can think, well, on a, on, a, on a single D6, you've got one in six chance of something being activated. Great. If there's two dice, okay, then, well, statistically, a seven is more likely. So am I going to buy something that's going to be activated on a seven? Maybe. And if I buy a one or a 12, it's a lot less likely to happen. Mm -hmm. But that's about as far Special as it goes. Oh, exactly, <laughs> that's the point. Yeah, see, which is weird because you briefly mentioned Dominion there, and in some ways Dominion feels like the same kind of thing. You know, you, you play these sequence of cards, you get a gold, and you decide what card you're gonna buy. And in a way, Dominion's the same. Dominion is, there's no long-term strategy really. You're, yeah. you're trying to just, change the flow of your deck a little bit yes, yes well in my opinion you can't you can't drastically change it you can't suddenly say right i'll go and change the strategy you've got to try and you're just constantly trying to tweak and you this can't deck. hugely affect your opponents which i think is the big drawback in the original base game yeah i think dominion intrigue which is the second set which is the first expansion i think mm. um Again, it doesn't really massively affect your, your mm. opponent. But you can it, kind of mitigate things that they yeah. might do, like a knight or an armour battle or whatever it is. Yeah. It's the same in Mashi Kuro. It is just, okay, I could buy a seven just in case they happen to roll a seven and I could get something for it. But that's about as much as you can do. But that's, that's basically how I played that game. I kind of, my, my little plateau of, um, of buildings did look like a, a normal curve, bell curve, based around the seven. Yes, know, I stacked exactly. all the cards, exactly. and, mm -hmm. you know, six, seven and eight were all, mm -hmm. you know, loads of them, and then one and twelve, and, me, and weirdly, I played it with, uh, I played it with Amanda's family, and they weren't doing this, and uh, funnily enough, I was winning, because mm -hmm. I was like, oh look, you've got a seven again, what were the chances of that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> actually quite high. That's <laughs> yeah, more, a lot more. That yeah. said, the, the less, the, certainly the higher number, less likely cards are more powerful yes you do get more money for it so it is mm. balanced in that yeah. sense but of course statistically it's less likely to happen but yeah. it's one of these things that yeah he's not going to roll a 10 it'll be fine of course you know four tens come out in a row and you're like really <laughs> <laughs> but the harbor expansion these dice are those again <laughs> they came with the game <laughs> really they're different color to the ones you were rolling earlier mm. oh um no <laughs> Um, but yeah, the Harbour expansion really changes that strategy mm -hmm. because you are limited to choosing what, ex what, what facilities you can build to pay, depending on what's on the board. Sometimes you just, I mean, you don't have to build something every turn, mm -hmm. but if you do choose to, you're limited to what's there. And sometimes there could be some right dross. Mm -hmm. And of course you're thinking, well, maybe I'll just buy one to see what comes next. But of course in doing that, you don't get to choose it. Your opponent gets the advantage. Yeah. It's a bit of a nightmare. Yeah. So there is more of a strategic element with the expansion. I think it's a good thing. Okay. Both, um, both myself and Alora do agree that the harbour expansion, the marketplace, is definitely a better game. Yeah. 
I think I might have to get hold of that then. Mm. That's good. You can buy, that. which is what I got, I got for it for, for Christmas actually. Um, you can buy the, the three in one little tin. Yeah, I've already got Machikura yeah. there, so I've already, I've already got a third of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm conscious of time because we're uh, getting along a bit. A bit Sweetly, I actually. Yes. Um, I'm conscious that I don't want to over stay our welcome in our listeners ears <laughs> um, so I'm going to round off quickly we've had a, we've had a well we've had one question come in which is better than nothing um, so Lab Wars which is at Lab Wars Games uh, on Twitter I've asked what are our favourite games so I'm going to ask John first even though I probably know the answer because he's already mentioned it about three times today uh, favourite game that is favourite yeah pick one pick one game above any other well then, then you game. obviously know the answer. Yeah, still, just, it's it's got to be Talisman because there's no other game that I've played. If you add up the number of hours that I've um, played that game, enjoyed playing that game, I should add as well. Not, it's not just you know <laughs> getting getting through. I mean, there are some games wow. where you spend a lot of time uh, just sort of getting stuff done. Whereas Talisman, I think it's more about the journey than the destination, <laughs> which is fortunate when it, when it typically takes at least three or four hours to play a game. Um, and one of those destinations could be everyone dies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no guarantee that everyone's gonna that someone's gonna win. <laughs> so yeah, I'd I'd definitely have to say um, it's got to be Talisman. Mm. Mm. Okay. Andy, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I was I was looking at this question thinking, oh God. And I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been thinking about it since since I read the question, and I still don't actually know. It's probably going to be a toss up between about two or three games, and it'll probably depend on my mood. I have to say, Dead of Winter is a very strong contender. Okay. Um, but having gone through Eclipse, which I'll talk about once I've actually played with other people, because um, I've gone through it a few times and it's pretty good, I can see it being a very, very, very good game and really right on my street mm. with other people. I mean, I really like it. I haven't gone through it on my own, but. I think, I suppose, it's going to be a toss-up between either Dead of Winter or probably Euphoria, I think, Okay. right now. They're both very, very different games. Yeah, yeah, they are, yeah. very much so. Um, but I, I think I probably prefer strategy games. Yeah. Um, so John likes, obviously, well, that's, that's a, a documented uh, stabbing in the back. Uh, yes. Um, there's a few I, traits, but I do, yeah, I, I do I mean, enjoy strategy also, games. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> but I, I, I do really enjoy strategy games mm. of loads of different types. But yeah, I think... I know Dead of Winter really strikes a chord with me. I quite like apocalyptic games, mm. generally speaking. Um, so I think probably Dead of Winter. But I may change that stance. What is yeah. it? It should always be a fluid thing. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got a bit of a toss-up as well. I'm between either the Star Wars X-Men Miniatures game or Arkham Horror slash Eldritch Horror. I'm going to group them as the same game yeah. because they're, 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 they're too similar. That It's just an expansion, really. It's, it's, yeah, it's an expansion <laughs> with an entirely board. So X-Wing is a miniatures game, so if you're not familiar, imagine like Warhammer 40,000, but X-Wing dogfights. Nice. So X-Wings versus TIE Fighters, effectively. Mm. But way beyond that now, it's you know it, the first few expansions were things like Millennium Falcon and mm. Boba Fett's ship, but it's gone way into this expanded universe stuff, and they've just brought out one for Force Awakens. So you've got the new, oh, yeah, T seventy X wings and do you get a BB eight, a massive one? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think even the little they're about. You know, an X wing is about an inch and a half long, so you can just see the little. No, you can't put one into the. No, X-wing. you've got a little one in the back, but you can't see which one it is. Uh. But I love that game because that is, it gets that miniature game fix. Because I used to love what when one or forty thousand. I, well, I think I think all three of us were that were there in one or forty thousand yeah. at some point Definitely. in our lives. And so. Blood Angels and Tyrants. Yes. About five years ago, I also got into War Machine, which is a similar game, but. The thing about those games is, again, it's the painting, the modelling, mm-hmm. and even even a short game of War Machine is going to take you two hours. Mm-hmm. Whereas X Wing, you don't have to paint anything because they're all pre-painted, and, really? they're, and they're really nice pre-painted oh, as well. Okay. You know, some of these things you see pre-painted miniatures and you go, "Oh god, that's terrible." But <laughs> X Wing all look beautiful. Chucked together in a dirty sweatshop. And you, you, there's no scenery because it's. Space, yeah, yeah. so yeah, I suppose, yeah. you just. I mean, I've got a, a couple mat. of the actual official mats at the little star fields. You make your little force with cards, so you can make a, a fleet up quite quickly, mm-hmm. and you can play a game in an hour. 
That's not bad. Not bad it, it gets you that fix mm. of that miniatures game tactics and getting close. And of course, the whole thing about trying to get your little dog, you know, the X Wing or TIE Fighter behind the other one. To, so, is that a uh, similar sort of thing with, um, you know, measuring things out with tape measures? and? What it's got is uh, rather than tape measures, it's got set templates. Okay. So, you've got a little dial. Yeah. Which you select, you move maneuver on, and every ship's got a different maneuver dial. Mm -hmm. So every ship's got a different range of actions, but mm -hmm. they're generally they only split into straight ahead, shallow curve, tight curve, mm -hmm. and then different speeds. Mm. And then for each one of them, you've got this little template that you right. you actually put onto the table in front of your model, and it slots into the front of the base of the model. Oh, and wow. you lift your model up and place it at the end of this template. Okay. So there's set patterns where people can be at the end of every round. Do you not so find it different if you've got to put it on the table, so it not hit other models? Um, you, there are ways around that. What you do is um, okay. That will probably yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. There are ways around that. I mean, yeah. I've, I've taken part in tournaments with this, so I know like, all the tricks to try and record where yeah. everything is on the table. Mm. Um, and of course, what usually happens is you crash into another ship or crash into an asteroid, which completely screws up your move. <laughs> but it's it really a little bit like Robo Rally. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a certain Robo Rally element to it. The other great thing about it is um, as well. When you think about War Machine and um, and Warhammer Forty K and Warhammer Fantasy, mm -hmm. you have that whole I go, you go. So yeah. I do an entire turn, you do an entire turn, I do an entire turn, you do, and you know, you have your army gone before you've taken the first move. Was, <laughs> Especially if someone's misinterpreted the rules. <laughs> yeah, but with X Wing, it's kind of this integrated thing where ships move depending on the pilot skill of the pilot in the ship you've got. Right. So you move in the order in which the pilot skill is. So you do all the movement. So there's like an initiative that tells. Yeah, yeah okay. and then you do all okay. the shooting, and what happens is that's the word I was looking for before. Initiative. Mm. Initiative. <laughs> so yeah, you you've got this kind of integrated thing, and the whole turn is everyone moves, and uh, okay. I, I think it's absolutely brilliant. And there's hundreds of ships now. They've even gone into this new Star Wars Rebels and taken ships in from them. I think See, this is a game I really do not need to buy. No, no, no. Oh no, if you've got junky mm. tendencies to no, stay away no, from it. No. And I'm just, I can feel the temptation it itching already. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's something else, John. I, uh... That was a weekend activity catching up with you. You're a bad man, Andy. <laughs> yes, yes well, I am. To catch it off you. <laughs> we'll, we'll not go into that. <laughs> anyway, so we're... <laughs> On that bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> that bombshell. Um, John, we... John and I have an appointment at the clinic. <laughs> We've overstayed our one hour that I was going to set for the podcast, so uh, I, I apologise. Yeah, um, so it's time to draw it to a close, I think. Um, thank you very much for listening. I've been Steve Cheater from polyhedroncollider.com. I've been Andy Lewis from my house, well, John's house, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been John Cage, well, uh, just John Cage, that's it. Just John Cage. <laughs> if you want to get in touch with us, go to either polyhedroncollider.com and there is a little um, email icon there, you can send us an email. Go to Twitter at polyhedronc and Facebook is uh, Facebook slash Polyhedron Collider. There's also a G Plus profile, but well, don't worry about no that. One uses that. <laughs> it's like a ghost town, that place is now. There's oh. tumbleweed animating across the screen there. <laughs> um, and actually there might be some other places that I can't remember. Yes, YouTube, of course, we put these videos on YouTube. They're now on iTunes. If you did actually enjoy listening to us, please leave us a review on iTunes. We'd like to know what you think. And if you have any questions for us, get in touch via any one of those various means I've just mentioned. Thank you very much, and good night. Tati See you guys.